The Mic. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Bates and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet Billy O'Connor. Today's guest. Actor in Boy Meets World, Bosch, and Animal Kingdom, William Russ. My brother. My brother Frankie. How you doing, brother? How the hell are you doing? Handling the heat wave. Having a heat wave? <laughs> Tropical heat wave. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today before we start is William Russ, famed actor, Boy Meets World, Bosch. Unbelievable. Did the Adam, Animal stuff. Kingdom. Uh, the he's, Sopranos. He's 40 years he's been around. 40 years. And like you often talk about, versatile. Yep, versatile is for sure. But That's before we start, I want to say that we have been awarded a very prestigious award. Derek, can you put it up on screen, please? Is there any money involved in this? <laughs> well, it, there might be. <laughs> what? Billy O'Connor has been voted one of the 40 top over 40 personalities on by Podcast Magazine. What? There's an ad that's going to run. 40. Billy O'Connor has been selected to the prestigious 40 over 40 national podcasters list by Podcast Magazine. Look at the ads running. This can't be on the level. That's on the level. Why me? Why not you? Well, first of all, because you're, you're a mook. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a mick. Look at, look at, see the ads going to run? Is this on the level? What, it's, what it's, is this? this is, do you think... Do you think we would go through all the problem of putting this ad together? You know, hundred plus guests have included Rod Carew, numerous Homer Fame members. We we talk about oh, podcasts. So look at you guys! Oh, hey, unbelievable! It's in. It's going to be in the August issue of Podcasters Magazine. So congratulations, you're you're. You know, the last time I was on the cover of a magazine, <laughs> <laughs> and this is legit. When I was up at UF, my girlfriend was running a very prestigious part of the English department at, at the college. And, of course, I'm running around Gainesville, which is a small enough town, doing dirty jokes. <laughs> I'm telling jokes, doing stand-up, but I'm doing jokes that are, you know, you see my stand-up. And, yeah. and I, was, I wasn't pulling any punches back then because they were all kids and they were loving the dirty old man thing. So yeah. I was playing it up. I'm a dirty old man, 63 years old, dirty Uncle Billy or whatever, telling jokes. <laughs> so my girlfriend comes to me and she says, do me a favor. For the love of God, she goes, you know, people are starting to pay attention to you doing comedy in this town. And uh, I got a prestigious thing. And they know I live with you you know, at the university. Can you tone it down a little bit? Could you just, I said, Jesus, you know, I didn't even think about it. I'm really sorry, you know. I'll tone it down. But unbeknownst to me, I hadn't thought about it. Two weeks earlier, I had done an interview with a guy for, uh, for, uh, what was it, Senior Magazine? Whatever magazine. Magazine it was. But we're not the 75,000 people in Florida, right? Senior Times it was. So I told this guy in the interview, yeah, I'm manic. You know, like, so, you know, I, I don't see any downside to everything. I see, I don't see clouds I walk on. I mean, you know, like, I, that's, I'm always up. I'm never down. So I go through this whole thing when I talk about comedy. Well, she tells me to tone it down. I said, no, I, I will. I, I'll tone it down. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you. And then, because after 75,000 people, they got me on the cover of Senior Times. And the lead is, Billy O'Connor uses stand-up comedy to combat mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, she takes the cover, and she throws it at me. And she says, thanks a lot for throwing it down. Well, I, I, didn't even know. I, I didn't think about it. I, don't know. I forgot about it. You know? uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool, man. Thank you guys very much. You you guys, uh, and congratulations are also in order. I think we mentioned this last week. but. On your uh, birth of your third, fourth, fifth uh, grandchild? Third, third, third. third. And uh, Meg's first. It was, and, and you just got back from a trip to New York? How was that? You know, on the way there, jet blue, the red eye. And I take those things for a reason, you know, because the, when you're traveling to New York, the first thing you got to think about, like L.A., what time am I landing and what's the traffic going to be like when I get there? Right. You don't want to land in New York at right. rush hour, you know, crazy. Red eye going in, jet blue, cool, seat in the middle, empty, nice flight, no problem. Coming back. And I heard Newark, Florida, and New York are the worst right now for travel because of canceled flights, congestion, the grief. Well, I get to Newark. Well, first of all, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm staying at my friend's house in Yonkers, and, and he lives on a side street off McLean Avenue. Anybody who knows Yonkers? 
So I said, geez, I got to get an Uber at four o'clock in the morning. I got, you know, I gave my friend back his car. I borrowed my friend's car. And Jenny's with you, of course. Of course. And, you know, bags, the whole deal. So okay. I checked the Uber. The biggest baggage of them all is you, but <laughs> yeah. you, I digress. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. <laughs> so, okay, another thing. We get to, but before I even get to this story, when I get to New York, turns out because of the July 4th holiday, her meds, her, she's, she's on her pain meds, and she's, she's been on them for three years, and she's supposed to get her meds. And they won't transfer them from California to New York, interstate or some grief like that. So she can't get him a Walgreens. So she's in pain. And I, I got a week in New York and she's in bad pain and she's coming off with trolls. She's like, you know, this is like three years they got around these things. So I call up my friend Crazy Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, I'll play Steve. I, this is a long shot, brother, but you, you wouldn't have any Tramadol. Tramadol, yeah, I got <laughs> What else you need? I got oxycodone. I got this. I got that. Yeah, come on. By the way, I got everything you need. So I hope I, his name's not Steve. Uh, oh, it's, it's, no, crazy it's Crazy Steve. Steve. Crazy Steve, yeah. So he typed this up. I mean, <laughs> God bless the misspent youth. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and she had went. She had called three or four urgent cares, and they wouldn't even deal with it because uh, painkillers in New York. New York's got one of the toughest drug laws in the country. No way she could get painkillers. That's why they got the fewest drug addicts, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> that shit works. <laughs> I remember one time I'm going through the Bronx, and I thought a guy. I saw a guy like in, in a corner, you know, and I thought he was. Well, look at this guy. He's doing the uh, uh, a mime. Taekwondo or yeah. something, you know, he's over there going like this. And, uh, and then when I got closer, it was just a junkie going into his nod, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Crazy Steve tightened this up. So now 4 o'clock in the morning, we're going home. And I call the Uber, and it, thank God, at 10 to 4, the guy says, the Uber's Troy, Troy, the Uber driver, is going to be there in three minutes, you know. All right, great, great, we're covered. Because otherwise, I'm in a jackpot. I'm not going to get to the airport. Well, Troy shows up, and he's a Rastafarian, right? Well, I can see the guy is blazed. <laughs> I mean, I know the symptoms. This guy's high as a kite. He's got the music blasting, jazz. Yeah, I'm going to get you out to the airport, no problem, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and as we're going out there, because it's the Washington Bridge, we're going into Newark, no matter what time of the morning, it's the Washington Bridge. And this guy, yeah, you know, horns beeping and trucks, and I'm in the back go looking at my GPS going, 11 minutes to the airport, I'm flashing Jenny, nine minutes to the airport, because the ride is like, right. I'm a little, you know, like, I'm, I'm, this guy's going to kill us. And, I mean, going across six or seven lanes, by, by the time we get to the airport, he missed so many turns that he just said, well, I'm, <laughs> I'll still catch it. Beep, beep, and I'm in the back like this. It reminded me when I was in Bangkok, I swear to Christ that this is true. They don't have driver's license. You don't got to get a driver's license in Thailand. You just get behind the wheel of the car and you drive. So the first time I'm experiencing this, we're in downtown Bangkok and it's like six lanes. And this guy says, I'm going to make a right-hand turn. He just starts to make a right-hand turn. As he's making it, beep, beep, traffic is backed up, beep. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. Of course, I'm blazed up in the back. I'm <laughs> high as a kite. This is Thailand. And I said, whoa, whoa, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us. He goes, stops, looks at me as he's driving. No can die. Have Buddha. <laughs> have Buddha. No can die. I see you. Maybe Buddha's not looking. What about me? <laughs> I don't have Buddha. Yeah, but I mean that was the kind and, of experience. And, and that is an example of why you're the, one of the forty top forty <laughs> podcasters in America. Because who the hell's got stories like that? A mishap, Frank. It was a mishap. <laughs> but and then we get to the airport, and of course, I'm sitting through the hour and a half. I mean, really a nightmare. An hour and a half to get to security. We get up to security, and they're breaking her balls. They won't let her on a plane because the ticket says Jennifer O'Connor, and her passport says Jennifer Beale because because of the pandemic and the, and the surgeries. She didn't get a chance to change the name on her passport, and they wouldn't let us on a plane. And they made us go back to check in. And have us change the ticket, which they wouldn't change. And they said, just go back and tell them you're on the back end of a round trip ticket. And now we had to wait an hour and a half again and not sure if they're going to let us on the plane. And by this juncture, she's like, uh, and I said, I'm fucking. And Why didn't you change the goddamn passport? What the hell's the matter with you? She didn't have a driver's license? Yeah, but a Jenna driver's license says Jennifer Beale as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God it was a health card that finally got around. She had another Jennifer O'Connor on it. 
So as, it was a nightmare. As yes. much as I admire your 40 over 40 by Podcasters Magazine, I wouldn't want your life for, <laughs> <laughs> for anything in the world. I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the, the wonderful world. What was that guy that always walked around here and everybody was always a mess in the cartoons? What the hell was it? I don't know. Anyway. anyway. That's my life. So yeah. we're going to have William Russ on today. Yeah. As a matter of fact, why don't you get him on now? Whose life was probably nothing like mine because he had a charmed <laughs> life. No sense. one's life is like yours. <laughs> Derek, can you bring on Bill Russ? There he is. Billy, how you hey doing? Hey, guys. Good to see you. <laughs> Hey guys, nice to meet you. That's Billy O'Connor. How are you, Billy? Billy? Nice to know you, brother. And that's my friend Derek Harris on, hello, on the hello. control. Hey, Derek. Derek control. Derek will. Your fate lies in Derek's hands. <laughs> now, are you Bill, Billy, <laughs> William, or Rusty? What, what, what should I call you? What Rusty's you? fine. Just don't call me late for lunch. Okay, brother. So be comfortable. With it. I I was talking to John Larroquette uh, over the weekend, and I said, "You know Bill Russ, don't you?" He said, "No, I don't think so." He said, William Russ, you don't know him? Rusty Russ? He said, oh, I know Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know John way back. Uh, Where did you work with John? Uh, well, I just knew him from around. I'm trying to think if we actually worked on anything, but we were friends. And, um, you know, he's from Louisiana, too, I think, at Rara Cat. Yeah, so I, that's, that's how your name came up. We were talking about. I was saying my friend Eddie Herbert, who knows you. Uh, Eddie Herbert, your friend? Eddie Herbert, my friend. Chef Eddie Herbert. He used to have the restaurant. Who grew up down the street from me. Yes. He grew up down, oh, wow. the, down the street. He That's used, right. He used to run the Lincoln Bay Cafe. Exactly. Uh, over on in Santa Monica. And he, yeah. he he always talked about growing up with Rusty Russ. But Laura <laughs> Kett said you were, grew up in Michigan. So no, I, no, no. let's let's let's. Find out where exactly are you from? Well, I'm a Navy brat. Okay. So I was born in, well, it would be the naval base, Portsmouth, Virginia, Norfolk. And uh, and then I then we moved. My brothers were born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Portsmouth, Maine. And uh, then I came, then we ended up in New Orleans for about, uh, you know, a couple of years. And we moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville. And we back to New Orleans. You're, you're from Jack. When were you in Jacksonville? Uh, when I was a kid, when I was about 10 years old. How old were you? What years? Uh, I'm trying to find out if they're the artist Gilmore years or not. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, that would be, I don't even remember now, 1960. Oh, I don't remember now. 61 to oh, 64. Okay. okay. But so did you go to. School in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to fi figure out for La Roquette so I can tell him exactly when you were in New Orleans. So you were in New, or New Orleans twice. Did you go to high school? I was in New Orleans, Orleans from, let's say, I was five years old, so 1955, till I was 10 years old, from maybe 1960. And then I was back in New Orleans. And I went to a, I, I went to so many different schools. My friends were in a, a school called uh, St. John Vianney, which was actually a, uh, an experimental seminary for Catholics, boys, to become parish priests. Yeah, Billy would have, <laughs> Billy would have been thrown out of that. Recovery Catholic. <laughs> well, anyway, Are you recovering Catholic as well? <laughs> recovered. I don't think I've recovered yet. <laughs> so, New Orleans, but, yeah, did you then I finished. Then I finished my high school at Jesuit High. Okay, so you went to Jesuit High School. My senior year. Same yeah. as Jay Thomas. Oh, oh, yeah, same as Jay. I worked with oh. Jay, yeah. yeah. You worked with Jay in the Judith Light movie, didn't you? That's right. We did a TV movie uh, where, uh, yeah, it was a sad movie, like most of those TV movies. I went through a period where I played, you know, the husband of the uh, actress of the month. <laughs> and the actress of the month was Judith Light. Uh, we, At that month, yeah, and she's a great actress and a lot of great actresses. I've, I've, was got, able to work with. I've got a picture of you with Judith Light that I didn't know that Jay's and and Jay together that I'll send Derek and Derek will put it up in post. So oh, God. so now you're on now. Of course, you had a great run on Boy Meets World, and we'll get to that in the future. But you're on Animal Kingdom now, right? Aren't you? Well, I, I did a couple of shows. I did about three shows for Animal Kingdom. It was really fun. I got the job mainly because of my hair. But 
Whatever works for you, man. Well, your hair was different than it is now. Why don't you describe your hair? Well, it was COVID hair. It was like 1968. <laughs> uh, I, I would have been cast in hair. It was down on my shoulders. It was pretty actually. Uh, it was actually kind of amazing to go through a year and a half without a haircut. And you, you're in the final season of Animal Kingdom now, uh, which is currently running. I think they're on the third or fourth episode now. But it's it's on TNT, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, TAT and uh, USA, maybe. Well, it's getting great reviews. Frank told me and Derek told me I got to watch the show. They told me it's terrific. Oh, you love it. Yeah, yeah. and and you won't you won't recognize Rusty. Not with the hair. <laughs> not, not not with the hair. Yeah, so it's easier to watch. <laughs> how long are you in, the, in this business, uh, Billy? How long all together, Rusty? How long are you in this racket? Uh, well. It depends on when you say so when it, uh, my first paying job was maybe I got to be 22. But the last time I worked as a waiter, cab driver, cook, bartender was maybe I was 26, 27. And I finally got an agent. And the first thing he did in New York was get me on a soap. So I didn't have to be a waiter. And my first soap job was Another World. I think that was probably around 1976, 77. So you did that and The Young and the Restless as well as soaps, right? And from what well, I yeah. I came back many years later. Uh, the producer uh, uh, had, a had actually worked in another world and asked me to come in for a bit. And I said, sure, hard work. It's so much harder now than it was when I did it earlier. So much work. You'd have 30 pages a day and no rehearsal. You just come in and go, go here, go here, go here. And you had to be ready to go 12 and, hours a day. And you ask, where can I write my lines? On the bottom, on the, <laughs> yeah, whose forehead can I Whose forehead, whose forehead, forehead on the bottom of ashtrays and the bottom of <laughs> drink glasses, coffee cups. You look at it, you say, ho. Oh, so, Daphne. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Daphne. So, uh, <laughs> so you really hone your chops. You really hone your chops on those soap operas, right? We've had a couple oh. of soap opera stars that say it's tough, tough racket, tough business. It's hard work. You got to be prepared. There's no discovering the role. You come in, you're ready to go, Ben. So, by 1982 or 1983, you you were in the pilot episode and in the, in the Second episode, also of Crime Story, with my with our good friend Stephen Lang. Uh, yeah. How did yeah. you go from waitering to Crime Story in a short, a relatively short period of time? You were killed in Crime Story, but uh, you you were shot in a in a phone booth. I believe that yeah. that, that wouldn't happen these days because there are no more phone booths. <laughs> Bad dog Cole, I think. Was yeah. the last I know. Legit got he, shot. He was shot in the Apple store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how'd you go from, how'd you make that leap so quickly? Uh, well, Crime Story came after, actually, I, I just got lucky as, you know, you need a little bit of luck in this business. Uh, you know, if not a lot of luck. And um, There's that word again. Someone had called me, I'd done Miami Vice. And I had done a guest star in Miami Vice, just a uh, casting director in New York, uh, called me up and said, we got a part for, for you, San called Sandy Bresler. I was in uh, L.A. at the time. And I said, yeah, it's the hottest show in, 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 in the world. Let's go. And I went down to Miami, and I shot um, Miami Vice, an episode called Evan. And uh, for some reason, that just hit. And... Uh, and then Crime Story came along. I love, you know, Michael Mann uh, offered me, said, what do you want to do in this? And I said, well, I, I, at the time, I was so full of myself. I didn't really want to be a, a regular. And I, I said, well, he's, I got a part of the guy gets killed. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do that. And uh, it was so much fun. It was such a great bunch of guys and such a vision that Michael had. And, uh, and uh, Ferrara directed it, Abel Ferrara. And uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience. Well, I, but yeah, I, really, I kind of shot myself in the foot a number of times during my career. But I'm not complaining. I've had a great, great run. Well, I, I see you were in Cruising, uh, which was a great movie oh. with, with that Don Scardino was also in that, wasn't he? Why don't you tell oh, us? Oh, yeah, a lot of New York actors. 
That was the uh, Al was, Pacino days. Uh, I had done a play. That's a, 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 a um, Billy's looking at me perplexed. But Scardino was an actor too. Score, sure he was. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh he was. He's a terrific really? actor. I didn't know that. Yeah, you ought to watch our interview with Don. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember the interview, and I remember Don, but I also remember him talking about you know being. He a, he also was in uh, Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. Do you remember any? I, I, let me let me just. Bill, Bill. This is about Billy. This is I know, about Billy. but Billy's got to un- <laughs> Billy's got to understand that this is the, one of the top podcasters, forty over forty. He, 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 he was he, he, he was a drug addict and alcoholic, et cetera. It's an uh, illegal bookmaker, nine uh, eleven first responder, veteran of the New York Fire Department for for twenty Vietnam, years. I got a few holes in my head. At, at Vietnam vet. At 58, he went back to school. At 62, he graduated from the University of Florida. And uh, he's, he's lost a lot of his marbles. And right now, <laughs> we're, we're, we're witnessing one of those. All right. So anyway, Don Scardino was an actor. And, yes. And, and, and Billy... Cruising was the first gay movie. Right. So, I remember Cruising. Who was, uh, well, I... was the star of Cruising? Al Pacino. Exactly. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so good. You remember Al, Billy? You remember Al? Sure, I remember Al. He's a Bronx boy. Al's from the Bronx. Uh, <laughs> so you were you were in that movie? Yeah. Well, I met Don Scardino. We had done a play called Kid Champion. I had a very small part. Actually, I moved more furniture than spoke in the play. But it was with uh, Christopher Walken, and it was about a rock star. And Don Scardino was one of the Chris Walken bandmates. And uh, so we had a great time doing that play. And, um, but yeah, Don Scardino, talented, talented guy. And didn't you appear with Al Pacino in another play? Well, I went in, I, I was on Broadway in the basic training of Pablo Hummel. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was yeah. thinking. About. Working yeah. Working with Pacino on stage, is that, was that a bit intimidating? Was, let me ask you an outside question. Who was the most professional? And you've worked with a lot of great people. I mean, I'm looking at you on a. Sopranos, you run so many, so many great stuff. The right stuff, great movies. Who was the most professional guy in your opinion that you ever worked with? Gosh, I gotta say the who comes to mind is one of the most. I mean, everyone was really pretty good, and uh, Burt Lancaster. Wow, I'm remembering just Burt always being there, ready to go, ready to rehearse, ready to shoot. Not uh, a Bronx guy, you know. He was yeah. Clinton. He was Clinton. And um, yeah, yeah was shooting bone in Mexico, and what was the name uh, of the movie you worked with him on? It was called Catalani and Little Bridges. Remember that? Uh, Lamont Johnson directed it. It was Burt Lancaster, Rod Steiger. I was in the gang with Burt Lancaster, uh, Scott Glenn, uh, Buck Taylor. Oh God, what an adventure! Mexico, Durango. Yeah, you. What's the furthest you traveled? Oh, I don't know. That's probably about it. No, <laughs> That's pretty far. Dur- Durango, Mexico? Yeah, the mountains of Durango. Who, or Hawaii. Uh, who, who influenced you as a kid, Rusty? Who was the guy who influenced you that and made you want to be an actor? Was it, was there any particular actor that you influenced you? That... No, you know, I didn't even decide to become an actor. So I, I was a sophomore. I was in the University of Michigan. I just wanted to get away from home, and I, somehow I got accepted to Michigan as an athlete. And I got there, and this is 1968, and there wasn't a lot of school going on. But uh, I spent a year there, and I came back, and I worked in the shipyard during the summer as a tack welder in New Orleans. I went back to Michigan. Didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Someone said, uh, why don't you, hey, can you do a scene or something for me? I said, what's that? Uh, for a speech class? And I said, sure, what do I do? He said, well, you learn the lines, and you do this thing. And I said, oh, okay. And I learned the lines, and did it then. Somebody said, oh, you're really pretty good. And I went, oh, maybe this is what I should do. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had blinders on because it was like the first time I always remember feeling, oh, this is where I belong. This is a place I can be. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just, I was thinking about this the other day. And then, as I said, the blinders were on. Then I just did theater. And I only thought about theater. That was the only professional actor I had had any contact with where theater actors at the University of Michigan, really. And I thought that's what I would do, being a repertory company. Or that would have been the, I would have been happier than a pig in you know where. 
it would have been fabulous. Everything else is just, wow, that door opened. I guess I should go through it. And I got very lucky. Well, anything to get you out of being a tack welder in New Orleans. <laughs> is, is a door I got a brief story. I got to tell you what, a real quick story. I was a welder's helper, which is worse than being a welder. I was a welder's helper in the Gulf of Mexico on an oil rig. My brother got me the gig. And uh, why are we first hearing about Derek? Why are we just <laughs> hearing one. about this for the first time? <laughs> they got me crawling into now it's August, right? It's August in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. I'm on a metal platform, a huge oil rig, and they got me crawling into 36 inch pipes, right? And when they're joining these pipes, they weld them from the outside. I'm on the inside with a buffer, right? <laughs> and I'm crawling into these long 36 inch pipes, and it's so hot that they got these two huge fans blowing in there, right? Now I'm doing this for about all of 30 minutes, and I got fucking metal spokes all over me from the thing sticking to me from the sweat and everything else. And I said, that's it. I'm out of here. Like, you know, so I'm crawling out the pipe like this, and I'm dripping sweat. And there's this coon ass who's the welder. And he looks at me and goes, you done got yourself a job this time, didn't you, boy? <laughs> I said, get me off this freaking thing. Yes. Get a helicopter. Get me out of here. And since you, me, and Rusty are the only three people that know what a coon ass is, <laughs> Rusty, why don't you explain what a coon ass is, Rusty? Well, it would be the same as possibly what other people would maybe call a hick. A hick. <laughs> or a farm boy. Forget that well. But yeah, I worked in the shipyard, and I know, Billy, man, I, you know, you would have to put on your leathers, and you always had to wear a long sleeve. I'm wearing one now. Levi shirts and pants and well, boots. Tough gig. And uh, it was a tough gig. I remember a guy saying to me, and I worked, you know, I like to go get my work done. I was a plumber's helper. Go tack up the uh, uh, hangers and get it done. And he'd say, okay. I'd say, okay, man, I'm done now. And he'd look at me and go, what have you done? You done already? I said, yeah, done already. He said, oh, well, why don't you go get yourself a piece of sandwich? Find a, find a place to lay down for a minute or two. <laughs> Do the accent. Great, man. You got the accent. Yeah, he said, go get me that key to pop over there. <laughs> what? Don't you say nothing to me not? No, no. No, <laughs> you got yeah. got the accent down people. perfect. Get a piece of sandwich. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. So did you live in a quarter? I mean, did you spend a lot of time in a quarter? No, no. Look, I was like, I was out in the suburbs like most kids. I didn't live in, in New Orleans proper. We were out along the river in a place that was then called Harahan, uh, about a mile from the river. I had five brothers and sisters, and we were just like little crazy Indians running around. In those days, there were woods everywhere. We'd run down to the river and, uh, you know, go catfishing, fish in the lagoon, you know, do silly stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I grew up, I was able to go down there, obviously, Mardi Gras was a huge, huge party, so I learned to party early, Billy, I mean, you and I got a lot of things in common, we may have known each other at another life, believe me. You never know, well, you talked about Maine before, I used to take a girl up to Maine to bang her. I, uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. I had to push Stop. that, Frank, you know what I mean, Stop. just a quick line, you know. So, yeah. we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Boy Meets World. One of the seminal shows of the 90s, 158 episodes you did, uh, worked with Ben Savage, Daniel Fischel, uh, Ryder Strong, what, Bill Daniels. Why don't you tell us about how you got the audition, what the audition was like, what the first episode was like. Uh, I've got a, so many questions because, you know, uh, it came back in 2014 or so as Boy Meets World, which I produced and got to work with Billy then. So. Why don't you tell yeah. us all, all about that? And there, oh, well, there's no, no there, you, you can there's no shortage of words you can use. Just talk. <laughs> well, it was a funny time in my career. I was kind of in between things, and I was, you know, uh, you know, an actor. You just never know. You have to, and you know, a lot of people can't be actors because they can't deal with that uncertainty. And I was at a point, I, you know, I had a baby girl, my, my beautiful wife and partner, Claire Wren, and um, I was in between jobs. And I remember they actually asked me, and, and honestly, they said, would you like to audition for this show, this uh, Friday, you know, TGIF type show? And, and at the time, I got to say, I didn't get the genre. I didn't get the three camera thing. I didn't understand it. And I said, no. You know, I'm really, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to do that right now. I, you know, I just wasn't comfortable with it, and I didn't know how it worked. And I literally passed. And, 
you know, and they said, okay, well, all right, we understand. And, uh, and then Michael, like, they went ahead and they shot a pilot with, uh, with a wonderful actor, uh, uh, playing the father. Do you remember who that was? It was Matt. Oh, Jesus. Sorry. Um, Matt somebody. Matt. Yeah, not you can look it up. I, I not totally LeBlanc. Forget. No, not <laughs> LeBlanc. Um, anyway, it comes up. But anyway, they, they shot the pilot, and then for whatever reason, they had an order. Now they had an order for 13, and uh, they came back to me. And for whatever reason, Michael had seen a movie I did, Michael a baseball Jacob, movie. Michael, Michael Jacobs, the executive Michael producer, Jacobs, who had creator, seen, who had seen Pastime. Exactly, which was produced by Jeff McCracken, who would, birth, who was also a guest on our show, and who would f go on to direct probably fifty or sixty episodes of Boy Boy Meets yeah. World. But continue. Yeah, and they they came back to me and said, "Look, they still would like you to possibly do this. Michael really wants to wants you to look at it and come in and read it. They want to recast." Uh, and I at that point I said, "Wow." Okay, um, I mean, one of my philosophies is if you're banging your head against door A and door B opens, I think I'm going to walk to door B yeah. <laughs> and stop banging my head. And that's kind of what I did. I said, sure, all right, what do I do? And I go to ABC, and in those days you went up in front of the big muck -and mucks and all the heads of the studio and the uh, network. And I just gave an audition and just did what I, you know, love to do is just be there and do the best I can. And by the time I drove home, they called me and said, well, you got the job. And I remember at the time, and I'm not the only actor that's felt this, a wave went over me of relief and gratefulness and wow, okay. <laughs> and then, and that was it. And I was like, wow. And also, thrilled. also, you had already, they had already gotten an order. So you, you went home with 13 episodes times whatever fee in your pocket. And that's a, that's yeah. a really nice feeling. Oh yeah. That was, and that was actually, you know, of course, you know, there was much more involved at that point than doing just the pilot at the time. And uh, it was like, you know, so yeah, I was grateful and excited. You, you talked earlier, Rusty, about when you took an appearance like it was a one-off, like you got shit, you got killed in the first episode. That was good with you because you didn't want the long, because you said you were full of yourself. I mean, how many years <laughs> later was this that you realized that this could be the best gig I ever had, financially, certainly? Well, I, I didn't know, and I thought, you know, because I only, I only planned so many months ahead, <laughs> sort of as an actor, and I'd been very fortunate, and I... I'd done a bunch of things, and I had done Capital News, a couple other series, and um, but I, you know, you never really relax about that. Um, but yeah, I was very excited. This is a maybe. It's only like, well, gosh, when did we start? Ninety one, ninety two. So it was three or four years where things didn't pan out the way I thought they would or hoped they would. And at that point, yeah, I was like, okay, I need, you know, sometimes like a lot of people. Why do you work? Because I need the money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actors are so special. Like, oh, you know, most people work for money. <laughs> well, a lot of times. Our, yeah. our our friend Stephen Lang used to say, "When I get up on January first, my one goal in life is to make my year. Make the nut. I got. I got to <laughs> make. I got to make my year. Make the nut. That's what I set out to do. And we've talked about it many times. That all the many guests we've had over the two years." doing his podcast and luck keeps coming into the equation and flexibility being flexible and god damn it reading your resume if anybody was flexible it's been you man i mean that's <laughs> you've done some great stuff i mean i don't want to I, I don't want to go off of boy meets world yet okay because uh well uh so but here's the thing here's here's what's interesting is i i was so naive to the genre even the table read I didn't, you know, I would go to table reads. I've done all hour shows. I've never done a half hour. You know, I've done all, you know, whatever they were, uh, Capital News with the great David Milch and, and you know, various shoes, uh, shows. And you'd sit around the table and, and, you know, sometimes if you wanted to get 
cup of coffee, you can get up and go. <laughs> and I remember I was at the table with the boy, and and we read, and it was great. And I was under, and at some point I'd gotten up to get some water and went back to my seat, and then we did the table read. Everybody gave their stuff and talked about it, and then I went into my trailer, and um, uh, David uh, David Trainer, the director, wonderful, beautiful director, came in and said, "They noticed you got up." Well, and went to get some water. Don't do that. And I was like mortified. I was mortified that I had done something wrong. It's like being an altar boy and spilling the holy wine. <laughs> yeah. This is something you didn't do. <laughs> so, but that's how naive I was about the whole genre and uh, the way it was shot, the way it was read, and the way it was written. I learned quickly because I was surrounded by some great guys, and I had to keep up with those kids. Those yeah, kids were so wonderful what, and smart and beautiful. What was it like working with Danielle and Ben? Danielle Fischel uh -huh. and Ben Savage. Oh, uh, they were this. I, I gotta say, you know, everyone says it's a cliche, but they were the sweetest kids in the world. I love working with them. They were so open, and they were so free, and they were so excited to be there. You know, and uh, and it was it was a joy, and and I I I learned so much in the first week, two weeks, three weeks from those kids, just watching them go at it and work, and I'm sitting there with all my complicated, you know, artistic <laughs> devices. Your your actor shit going, in your head, <laughs> yeah, just stuff in my head, which doesn't help an actor at all. <laughs> and I just follow their cue. There is. It was it was a joy. It was a joy, and I learned something every day. That's what was so beautiful about it. And how did they change over the years with success? Well, you know, I don't know if they – well, they did change. We all change. And, of course, you're going to change a lot when you're 12 <laughs> to when you're 19, hopefully. And uh, – I, you know, it's only when when we everyone got a little older and you know got their cars and uh, their phones and we're getting ready to go to college and um, you know the, the you know the your your adult personality starts to come out you know and and you grow hopefully and we know each other so well at the time um, they were they were pretty much the same you know Ben went his way and there's certain things and everyone grows up. Uh, uh, a writer was always what he still is now. Beautiful, intelligent, Writer's well friend. read, well uh, educated, sweet guy. And his brother and his parents were great. Danielle, I'd love to see her blossom and change over the. I, I haven't seen them as much over the last 20 years, obviously. But, you know, they've all grown into these really wonderful human beings. Will Fredell. Oh, a sweetheart, and we still laugh out loud together. And what was it like working with John Adams? Oh. <laughs> Billy Daniels. With Mr. Daniels. Oh, my God. What can I say? Bill and I had actually worked twice before. We'd done a TV movie uh, called Rehearsal for Murder, which was me and Bill Daniels and Jeff Goldblum and uh, Robert Preston and Lynn Redgrave. Wow. Madeline Smith, great wow. cast. I know, really, wow, huh? And then I had done St. Elsewhere. I'd done three episodes of St. Elsewhere where everybody it followed St. Elsewhere, the hospital, over 30 years. And uh, so I met Bill, you know, a couple of times before. And actually, when I knew he was in the show also, I was like, wow. Uh, how can I not be a part of this? But Bill was great. We've been friends over the years, and I've seen him just recently, and he's he's still a joy, one of my joys to be able to. I've been very fortunate to work with some icons, from George Burns to Burt Lancaster to Rod Steiger to Bill Daniels. Yeah, for Bill, goodness sake. Bill Daniels can be seen almost every day having lunch in the same table at Art's Deli in the Valley uh, with his wife. Who he's been married to? What's it, what have they been married for? Well, Seventy something years? years, sixty something yeah. years. Probably, yeah. They met in college. And what what's his wife's name? Do you remember? Bonnie Bartlett. Bonnie Bartlett, who was also a terrific actress. Oh, terrific actor! Ter terrific actor! Terrific actress, yes. And uh, he was 
he was uh, what well, I said John Adams, but he starred in Broadway musical 1776 on Broadway, didn't he? Oh wow! Or, or, <laughs> yeah, as John Adams. As John Adams. As John Adams, huh? Yes, and the uh, the high school in Girl Meets World in Boy Meets World was John Adams High School, named after Billy Daniels' role in in the play 1776. And then when we came back, oh, who knows, 20 years later to do Girl Meets World, we named this junior high school that the kids went to John Quincy Adams Junior High School. So <laughs> too cool. Too cool is indeed. Well, we had uh, Danielle Fisher on here and she was just, she was great. She was, she, she turned into a terrific director. She, she, oh, yeah. She's doing, you know, a lot of Disney shows and she's, you know, she knows where the jokes are. And she knows where the cameras should go. And that's the important thing for a director. Should. Well, you've been acting yeah, and she's... directing. Well, what do you prefer? Do you prefer acting or do you prefer directing? Or you just prefer a paycheck? Or is there a... <laughs> <laughs> well, directing I fell into. And honestly, I just was finding my way and relied on people around me for the most part. And I, I it was just a great opportunity. And if I went back to school, I'd probably go back to directing. I enjoyed it. I I love acting. The acting is, is so kind of pure and, you know, you can just kind of live in the space for a bit. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. And it was like the first place that I found that I felt really comfortable. But by, by the time I came into directing Boy, now by then I'm like 45 years old. I'm 50, I, I, you know. And I just had enough knowledge just to walk out there and try not to trip over the cables. And I knew enough to listen to people who actually hopefully knew more than I did. And then the cast and the writers and the producers, everyone was so helpful. And it was just a joy, just a joy to direct. And I, and I love the, the stress, you know, directing is, is like a lot of directors will tell you, I'm sure you've heard it a million times, you just have to answer a lot of questions all day. <laughs> and I would answer them whether I knew the answer or not. But uh, fortunately it came through and nobody got hurt. <laughs> Nobody died. Huh? <laughs> Not yet. You know, I I look through your resume and like Billy Billy O'Connor, I'm just amazed at the breadth and depth of your work. Uh, I, I noticed you did five episodes of Boston Legal as the ADA Christopher Palmer. What was that like to to work with that cast? Oh uh, well, it was a great cast, and uh, Bill De De Delia who was the producer, director of that, was beautiful enough to bring me in and let me play on their set for a while. It was a great cast. And again, most of, you know, everyone really, was, you know, they're so professional. As you know, Frank, you don't have time to fuck around with TV shows. you got to come in and go to work. And, um, you know, everybody had, uh, you know, their own little world. But, you know, honestly, most of the people... I've worked with, and I've worked with some, like I said, a, a lot of different people. I've never really had much problem with anyone, and everyone usually comes to work. If there's some delay, a lot of times it's technical. But for the most part, of all the, you know, if you add it up, I don't know, 100 actors, 100 shows, whatever, most have been just a joy and fun to be there. And most people um, really enjoy that. And when they didn't, you know... It, it was more sad than anything, you know, when people didn't appreciate where they were or their work or the people around them. You know, it can be aggravating, but for the most part, it was it was sad to see that. But I got to say, in my experience, it was very rare, and most people were very happy to be sitting in a chair, like I still would do on a set, sit there in a chair on a, on a stage going, Oh my God! I'm a professional actor. <laughs> you know, I can just eat any time I want and sit in a chair with my name on. I never lost that, you know, and I missed that. It was great. It was really fun. Well, you know, you shared, like I said before, you shared the stage with Joanne Woodward, Al Pacino, New York Stage. You think Macbeth? I mean, you you're pretty much a purist. I mean, do you feel more comfortable on stage or on film, or do you feel more comfortable in a on TV or? Well, you know, the state, it was interesting because when I went to New York, that's all I thought I'd do. I never thought of anything else. TV and movies, that was like for really talented, handsome, beautiful people. I thought I'd be a stage actor. That's all I thought I'd do. Um, 
I didn't really, I don't think I ever even got to audition for a TV show. You know, I was just in New York driving a cab, being a bartender, being a waiter, doing a showcase, hoping to get into a good play and hoping just to get an agent who could maybe get me a job on a show. And then I could just do theater. The last year I was in New York, I did like five plays and I did soap opera for a year. And, uh, and that's what I thought I'd do. And then all of a sudden, as I said, um, someone offered me a TV movie. And at the time, I had uh, you know some personal problems in New York. And I said, well, I'm just going to go to L.A. I'm just going to stay for a while. But the stage, I think, is where you really learn as an actor. Because it's your medium. You're in control. What the audience is seeing, for the most part, is you. Um, you know, obviously, there's lighting and sets and all that. But you're the medium. And uh, not so much on TV or film. It's a different, it's the director's medium, you know, more. But no, I love, you know, the stage is fun and beautiful and it's exciting. And that's where you learn to really work. You forget that you would rehearse a play for three weeks, six weeks, two months. Um, and then go out and do it every night. You, there's just, you can't replace those skills. Do you remember the, your Broadway debut? Well, I was replacing someone, so it was it was a great part. It was a part of a of the bully who bullies Pablo Hummel all during the play. I'm like getting into fights with with Pablo Hummel and just going crazy every time he walks into a room. And I was replacing someone, and they were so great. They I rehearsed, and and they brought in the whole cast, and the whole cast was like, oh my god, there was so many people in it that were went on to be a terrific actors and movie stars and but they came in and we did a dress rehearsal just for me and another couple of guys and uh we ran through the play and i was so excited and then i had uh, danny hedea was like my confidant in the play i don't know if remember danny hedea danny sure. hedea played nixon yeah <laughs> danny a wonderful actor and he would just say okay exit right we're going behind the stage Run over here. Okay, wait a minute. No, not yet. Not yet. Now, go. And we'd make an entrance somewhere, and I'd hopefully <laughs> knew the lines and jump in. And then he would say, okay, is it right? All right, let's go down this thing. And then I'd run downstairs. He said, we've got like 15 minutes. There's a constant poker game going on underneath the theater. And we'd run back up. <laughs> That's and right. Would say, okay, we're, we're entering the left over here. Remember, this is the scene wow. where you say, Al, go fuck yourself again and again and again. I go, oh, okay, right. <laughs> you know? So it was a blank to me. It was just a blank the first night, of course. Did you ever go up? All those guys were so great. Did you ever go up uh, on your lines? Nothing weird, no. No, I don't remember going up on my lines, but that's probably because I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we had Jeff McCracken on here, and I think he said, uh, I, I could be, my memory's a little faulty, as Frank will tell you. But you really don't make any money on Broadway, right? I mean, it was the soaps that paid the rent, I would imagine. Well, yeah, you didn't make money, you know, compared to TV or soaps. You know, because I was doing, and who got on Broadway? I mean, I'm not a big musical guy, and most of Broadway was musicals. God knows I wish I had that talent. I love that talent. Look at me, I'm on stage. <laughs> 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 you know, God, I wish that another life, another life. But you know, mainly you're working off Broadway in the 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 small houses. Then where we were lucky to get ninety bucks if we did a three week run. Whoa. Um, and you're working, you know, and then you go get your waiter job again or get back into the cab. Um, but that's where you learn. That's again where you started. And if you lucky, and I was lucky enough, I kept going. I would go to the Playwrights Horizon, which read new plays all the time. And they would, uh, you would just literally walk around the streets with your backstage going, oh, they're casting here, they're casting there. This is before I had an agent. And you'd show up and go, can I read? Do you have anything I can read for? I did this at Joe Papp. I did this at the Public Theater. Um, I did this at Playwrights Horizon. I did it at the New Dramatist. And I'd say, uh, look, I, I, there would be a part, a small part of a stone hippie in a play called The Last Christian. I said, look, Anybody can do this part. I really want to do it. I really want to do it. Can I just do the reading? And they'd say, yeah, okay, and did the reading, and then now I knew the guy, right? So now I went back another month later and goes, oh, yeah, we got this other play we're doing. It's called uh, Visions of Kerouac. 
uh, do you want to read for Neil Cast this part Neil Cast? And I go, sure, it's a good part. Yeah, it's, yeah, read for it. I went in, I read for it, and boom, I got this part. And then we did a reading, and it was the part that got me started. Um, playing Neil Cassidy to Jack Kerouac, Lane Smith playing Jack Kerouac, Joey Pantaleone playing Gregory Corso. Joey Pants. Joey Pants. And Neil Joey Cassidy, Pants. that's the biggest, that's the second biggest part in On the Road in Kerouac's novel, Neil Cassidy. Well, movie. yeah, it was, it was a beautiful. Speed Freak, pretty much, right? Oh, he was, freak. yeah, yeah. Total Speed Freak out. And it's interesting because I didn't even really know at the time. I was kind of hadn't been up, and I wasn't quite sure who the character was. I just knew the character at the moment from reading the play, and then, uh, then obviously I realized who it was. A guy named Martin Duberman had written the play. A wonderful playwright, a wonderful writer, and uh, and then I realized who it was. But I, I came in so much, not even playing Neil Cassidy. I came in playing what was on the page in the play. And um, it was just, a, again, one of those moments where you just got to keep showing up. And, you know, hopefully that door opens if you happen to be walking down 42nd Street at the right time. I, my first play for the public theater was because it was a Friday afternoon. I had to go into my waitering job at 6.30. I'm sitting in my apartment, probably half stone. I go, well, I should just get on the subway, go down to the public theater, just, just do it, just see if anything's going on. I go down to the public theater. And they're auditioning something. And there's an actor that I go, hey, hey, Bobby, is anything in this for me? He goes, yeah, yeah, you can read this part here. And they said, oh, great. And they came in. They said, oh, okay. Said, yeah, we'll give you a shot. And I went in and read. And I got this part. And it was my playing a, a rock and roll star. Uh, and it was the first play up at the Lincoln Center for the public theater. But only because I got off my butt in the apartment. <laughs> And we got on the subway and went down and begged just to see if there's anything in the door. Yeah. Perseverance. That old gig. Knock on doors. Perseverance. Perseverance. Do what you got to do. La la later in your career, you know, from like 2000 on, uh, or, you know, maybe even earlier than that, you were a, a pretty well known entity. Uh, when you showed up on the set of Sopranos, did any of the Soprano cast know who you were? <laughs> well, I only worked with uh, with uh, 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 Tony, Tony Soprano. Um, yeah, I mean, I would walk in people knew from Miami Vice or from, you know, Boy or or uh, Wise Guy or, uh, you know, some other things. But I I'll tell you the funny story of that is that um, um, uh, Gambafini, I never worked with an actor who I was so intimidated by his character. I wasn't intimidated. You know, Galifini was sweet, 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 but I couldn't get over the fact that I was sitting at a table with Tony Soprano. <laughs> wow. Even as a person. I'd never had this happen before. <laughs> and I was so intimidated. <laughs> it's just I'd never felt this 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 intimidation that I was sitting with the character that the actor that James Gandolfini had been playing. And I felt it was a weird dimension to be on. So he was that good. He actually had convinced you that he was Tony Soprano. I mean, that's what you were looking at. Like you were talking about. Yeah. Or uh, well, I convinced myself. <laughs> I, I had read an interview with Stephen Van Zandt and he said that Gandolfini, oh. he said it was almost like the soap opera thing where he was, he had to be on, on camera. David Chase wanted him on camera all the time. So every week his his part was enormous, like uh, an incredible uh, memor memorization he had to do. To oh, yeah. It was one of those moments of the merging of character and actor that happens sometimes that just goes beyond anything you could imagine. Yeah. You know, you can see it. Some actors like George C. Scott and Patton, yeah. you know, it's just... There are just some parts, Peter O'Toole's Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, there's some parts of the actor and the character meld so well. It's it's fascinating when it happens. But I'm, I'm surprised that you were intimidated by his character because you had worked with Dennis Farina in Crime Story. Uh, uh -huh. You had worked with, uh, in, in Wise Guy, you had done a lot of crime work. Uh, <laughs> you had worked with a lot of underworld people. What was it that 
made Gandolfini's character so intimidating? I think, well, I don't know if it was the, it, it, it was the fact that I couldn't separate Gandolfini from the character. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, sure. That I didn't, you know, when we sat down at the table and we just had this one little scene and I was excited to do it. It was really fun and I got to play a New Orleans guy. Uh, but there was just something, again, it was this melding of character and, and the actor. And when he sat down at the table, I couldn't separate me, William Ross, from um, Tony Soprano. It wasn't Galdafini that was sitting in front of me. It's it because it was, it was Galdafini. I mean, it was Tony Soprano. And it was just a strange phenomenon. But I think it's that meld of... And, of course, I had watched The Sopranos. I was a huge fan of it. And uh, it was just an interesting feeling that I took note of that I hadn't felt before. <laughs> and he was very gracious. I got to ask but you, uh, on that note, when you were playing the Wise Guy, when you did 14 appearances on Wise Guy, your character's name was Roger Loco Coco. Is that correct? Loco Coco? <laughs> that's like Joe Bag of Donuts. Right? I mean, that's like. <laughs> yeah, Roger Loco. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was a very fun show to watch, to, I, to do. I'm, all, I'm, I'm never surprised when you turn up on one of my favorite shows. Uh, you, you turned up on as Captain Garwood. On Bosch, uh, how was that, what was that like working with that cast? Uh, well, I have to tell you, you know, a lot of I knew a lot of the guys on this show, and the, and and they're uh, Dan Pine and Aaron Lipstadt, the producers and directors. You know, brought me in. It was, but I have to say, the acting on that show as a fan of the show was so good that I said, oh man, I got to make sure my game's up to par. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden I'm I'm jumping into the British Open here. I gotta know what's going on. So yeah, it was it was beautiful and all those guys are, are really such terrific actors. And it it really was a a, a challenge. It was really I, I really just had to really be there. You know, Frank, try and be there with them. Frank mentioned to before that I graduated at sixty two from UF and I graduated a journalism program and Michael Connolly, of course, the creator of Bosch, is, you know, in the journalism school of UF, he's God because he graduated from UF. Was he ever on set at Bosch? Was, was oh, yeah. Conley yeah, was he was around. He was terrific. He came up, he introduced himself, and he was very kind and said, wow, thanks for being here. And I said, oh, thank you for having me here. <laughs> yeah, no, he was around. He's a very personable guy and seemed open and, you know, loved being around the set. And, yeah, he was around a lot. Well, can you tell us a little about Titus Welliver? The character. Oh, Titus. Well, yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. I first met Titus again 30 years ago. I was doing a show called Capital News uh, that David Milch had written about the Washington Post, really. And somehow I met Titer, and um, and and he he was with some other agent. We both had uh, maybe and maybe had the same agent at the time. And the funny thing about Titus, Titus is what I remember. He told the story about Chris Walken meeting him. And Chris Walken saying to him, Titus, Titus, are you the king of some country I'm not aware of? <laughs> I, I laughed. I laughed so loud. I never forgot that. And I'd seen Titus. We'd run into each other over the years. But what a terrific actor. He, on um, on Milch's uh, uh, Deadwood, you know, I reconnected with Titus. Yeah, uh, and, and Titus is a, a a British actor or an Australian actor. No, Titus is. I don't know where he's from. He's he's from New Jersey, as far uh, as I know. I okay. don't know. <laughs> no, he's great. He's a big jazz fan too. He's, he's he's an interesting guy. He's very bright, very smart, and terrific actor, and fun to work with. You know, again, as I said, I've been very fortunate. And most most of the wonderful actors I work with, the one thing about them, they have a great sense of humor. They have a great sense of humor about their work and themselves. You know, have I you have to say that. And Titus is one of those guys. Ha have you seen people who don't have a sense of humor about what they do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've been around that a few times. But you know what? They just make themselves miserable. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and you've been on set. You got, you know, long enough, you know. You know, when you're miserable on a set, it's a long day. <laughs> it is a long day, for sure. Fortunately, I have. The hardest day I ever had, I'll tell you, uh, go, 
No, you go ahead. Okay. The hardest day I ever had at work was a day on Wise Guy. There were four of us. And we had to be in this house all day, and we had this scene where the four of us are trying to figure out what's going on. And at some point during the day, we got the giggles. And we couldn't do a scene without cracking each other up. And what we had to do, what made it the hardest day at work for me, despite rain, mud, anything, you know, snow, I don't care, was that we couldn't hang out. <laughs> we would have to go to our separate corners in the set, which is this big house. And when they said rolling, we would have to come together and look at each other and get the scene done and then walk away <laughs> and not be able to talk to one another because we're laughing so hard. And it was the longest day I ever had on a set, I got to tell you. <laughs> you know, nothing is worse than the giggles. When, when a cast gets the giggles, uh, they can't get out of it. And I, I don't, I can't, I don't know what it is. He can't, he can't relate to that. <laughs> you guys, oh, you never oh, get the yeah, giggles, do you? Oh, yeah, we oh, get the giggles. Der Derek got jokes today. <laughs> Just Derek got jokes. Well, you guys, you know, should be called the Mick and Mook and Giggles. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, that's what we're going to call you, Derek, from now on, Mr. Giggles. Well, we definitely can't call you Giggles. <laughs> 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 did you, uh, you, let's see, you did so many great, well, you were in so many great films, uh, Right Stuff, American History X, Pastime, of course, which you run so many accolades for as a over-the-hill pitcher. Any favorites? Uh, what was your favorite film to work on and why? Or? Uh, wow. Or show or yeah. play, whatever. Yeah. You know, um, gosh, uh, wow, well, good question. I love being actually a, I love being a, a part of the right stuff just because it's a great story. I just was happy to be in that. And I actually, I love American History X. You know, it's great film. such well, a dynamic film. And of course, Boy was an experience that I'm still grateful for to Michael and everyone around that had me, as I said, against my own will, <laughs> a part of. It's just amazing to me what a life story it was and what a life lesson is that you never know. You never know. Sometimes you're resisting the most important thing you should be doing. It's, it's a great lesson to learn how to really listen and be open to, to things that you might be pushing away or you can't see at the time. But Boy was certainly a, Boy Meets World was certainly a wonderful experience, I got to say. What's the smallest residual check you've ever gotten from uh, the guild? Well, there ain't many less than zero. <laughs> <laughs> but when the guild sends you a bill for one cent. <laughs> a bill. <laughs> then I guess I owe you a cent? No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I, I never understood how somebody could get 23 cents residual check when it costs 50 cents to mail it. <laughs> I know. I ask my that, that, myself that uh, every day because I get them every day. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it, it should be that anything under a dollar gets deposited into the Screen Actors Guild pension program. Exactly. Uh, or the actor's home. Or the fund. actor's home. Uh, sure. And uh, instead of going through all the wear and tear of writing the check, mailing the check, which costs 55 cents to mail for 23 cents. It's, it's crazy. But, I know, it is crazy. But, you, but that's bureaucracy for you. Yep. But you've had a, you've had a wonderful career. Uh, before we close, I want to ask Derek, Mr. Giggles, do you have any other qu questions? <laughs> I, I, uh, one question I have is you mentioned, uh, first of all, being on stage and how, how that's the actor's medium. Uh, what do you mean by that? It's the actor's medium, and, and why do actors? Why do they become so good from working on stage? Well, because on the stage, there's nothing between you and the audience. It's as close as you can get to having a a, a conversation with someone on the street. And there's no screen. There's no projector. There's no editing. And the behavior, which acting is, acting is you know, um, um, living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. And that's what every actor has a gift for that. And, you know, any five-year-old has that gift, but <laughs> hopefully you can refine it. And it's called living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. 
but there's no, I, I feel that the, the energy that comes through the actors expands beyond the stage. And it's interesting to see, I go to a community theater and sometimes see the difference, not a big difference, but I love community theater and the actors, and everyone does it for love. But the, the actor is the medium. He's the instrument through which the playwright writes his music. Um, he's, he's hitting the notes. He's hitting the, he's the violin. He's the bass. He's the, the drums. He's the cello of the writer's orchestra, so to speak. He is the orchestra. And that, that's, that would probably be the best analogy. It's like how Chopin gets his novel through the orchestra to the audience directly. I think the idea is maybe it's it's directly, it's right in front of you. I think that's what I mean by that, Derek. I hope that answers your question. You know, yeah, it does. You, had, you, you mentioned Peter O'Toole before. Peter O'Toole mm -hmm. had my one of my favorite lines in my favorite year when he said, I'm not an actor, I'm a movie star. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's such a big difference between being of an actor course. and being a movie of star. Of course. Well, that's why you... And you see movie stars are movie stars. A lot of them don't do stage. They wouldn't, it would be hard, maybe, or they don't choose to. I'm not saying they couldn't, but it, it's a different medium. That's for sure. That's for sure. You know, you triggered a memory there when you talked about being on stage and telling the truth. Look at the audience and tell them the truth. I, I remember reading a line from Cagney, and he said, acting is about learning your lines, hitting your mark, look them in the eye, and tell them the truth. And, uh, and, and stage, I guess the, 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 the truth rings true. I mean, it's like it's, you've got you to convince people that you're on the level. Exactly. And the audience is a true receiver of it. They know when something's wrong. They may not know why, but something doesn't quite work. In the film, you can, you know, tighten up the cues. You can add a little music. You can change the lighting. You can change the frame, you know, telling the audience, oh, this is important. This is important, you know, or not. And on stage, the actor does it. Obviously, you have writing and costumes and all that, but ultimately, the medium is the actor's life that he brings into that world on the stage. Yeah, you can't do it over. You, right. You get one take for the entire show, whereas, you know, in movies or even in, in television, you get take Yeah, take, that's take, another take, thing. Take you know, three, when you start four. the play, it's like playing, you know, it's like playing a sport. You start, you go to your finish. There's no timeouts. <laughs> and the audience's reaction, I imagine every night could be different. I mean, uh, at different parts, they'll laugh at different moments. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And that's, that's the thrill that's of it. And there's a couple of plays I did that the audience was so alive. Um, just uh, amazing moments. And for an actor, it's, it's special because also that night is gone. It's gone. You can't look at it again. It's that moment. It's over. And then you come back the next day and you try again. <laughs> you know, it's incredible to me when you talk about Broadway and performing on Broadway. They do, you know, eight episodes. I mean, eight performances in six days or yeah. something like that. I mean, to, to do a performance and put your all into it, uh, into a matinee at two o'clock, and then have to come back. And do mm -hmm. it again yeah. is incredibly arduous, incredibly hard. Uh, oh yeah! And I, I give you all the credit in the world for mastering that craft, as well as all the other great performances you've given us over the years. It's well, thank you guys. It's it's been my pleasure, and you guys are so much fun to listen to. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. We learned a lot. I tell you, I learned a lot about acting, and I don't know shit about acting, but I learned a lot about it today from you. You gave a clinic. Ah, uh, you're you. very kind. That's You're legit. very kind, Billy. Thanks I for appreciate being, it. Rusty, thanks for being with us. I'll see you soon. Hey, thank you, Frank. All the best. You betcha, Derek, pal. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. <laughs> thank you, be, pal. Be well. We'll see you down All the road. Right. Be safe. Later. Boy, you can see he really loves the craft. Yep. He really he really loves acting. I mean, he loves being an actor. And, uh, and, and, and like you said, he's a bit of a purist. I mean, you know, the Broadway thing is... Uh, well, you know, we, we talk about all these actors. We talk about Stephen Lang. We talk about Don Scardino. They all have got, talk about Billy Russ. We talk about Jeff McCracken. They all have got a certain, I don't know what in common. They all love it, and they all 
you know, they all have waited for success. Time, you know, he was 26 years old driving a cab. I wanted to ask him how he got his medallion. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, a good I, question. I, you know what I want to ask him? I want to ask him the name of the bar. He tend the bar in New York. I, I probably would have known the name of the bar. I mean, uh, you guys, but the flexibility again, you know, the idea of being flexible, the idea of having to do what you got to do to stay alive. You know? We just had him on. You guys could have asked these questions. I yeah, I mean, I don't know if anybody else would be interested in what bar he tend to bar. It would interest me. You know, but you just said before about the matinee, how you can do eight shows uh, on Broadway. You know, doing the stand-up bit that I was doing for the few years I was doing it, I could go out on a Friday night and kill on a 7, seven o'clock show. I mean, just destroy. And I still hated to come back at 9 o'clock to do the second huh. show. No matter, it just, it was just like I said, I did it. I did the bit. I already. just did it. I did it. I don't want to do it again tonight. Tomorrow night, all right. But that, So it must be really murder. I, I, I remember one time on Daddy Dearest, uh, Don Rickles was going to Vegas. And Richard said, how many shows do you do in Vegas? Now, in the early days, Don would do a midnight show, a 2 a.m. show, a 4 a.m. show. Uh, you know, the 4 a.m. show would be for the other performers in Vegas. But now Don was at the height of his career. He looked at Richard and he said, one show. <laughs> he said, you do two. That's right. You had to do it. I mean, Fridays and Saturday pay. nights in any comedy club, it's two shows. It's it's seven o'clock and the nine o'clock show and uh, about a 10 o'clock show. But yeah, it was tough, the second show. Always. Tough indeed. But we've had stand-up comics here and they've talked about Friday night, the late show, because now you get the bride, bridal parties and all that yeah. shit. And, and it's all about them. It's not about you anymore. You're on stage. It's tough. Well, but he was great. What a, what a great idea. He was great. great. Great get. Great get, Frank. And nice again, guy. congratulations on being named <laughs> one of the 40 over 40 podcasters in America. Where's the residuals, Frank? Where's the check? Is it in the mail? They're, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming for sure. It's coming all over me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. It's coming. Oh, God. Put me in, coach. I don't smoke. <laughs> You say good night, Billy. <laughs> good night, fellows. And then, uh, ladies and, and, and yeah. already. There, there's, there, there's no after that last joke, there's no ladies <laughs> still watching. <laughs> Thanks for tuning Be well. In. Take care. Next week's guest, college basketball's power brokers, the Pump Brothers. <laughs>